it is amazing to have right here in Steamboat Springs two of the foremost experts on global security and foreign policy in the world right here in Steamboat Springs. So Peter Brooks and Elon Berman, I'd like to welcome them to the stage. Let's give them a big round of applause. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? How about me? Good? Great. All right. Great. Perfect. Great. Well, thanks, Jennifer. It's great to be here. Um, it's great to be in Steamboat again. It's a wonderful place. This conference is a wonderful place and terrific exchange of ideas and thoughtful, thoughtful insights. It's great to be with Elon Berman. Uh, we've known each other for quite some time. I don't know if we've ever been on a panel before, have we? No, no, no. But our offices are uh, long three, time three blocks from We're three blocks from each away. Other, so. we, uh, we, see each other, we see each other quite a bit. So it's a great <coughs> opportunity to, uh, to be here uh, with him, uh, him today. Uh, and, of course, it's great to be in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, one of my favorite places. Uh, just beautiful out there. I wasn't crazy about the 40-degree temperatures this morning, but uh, be that as it may. In fact, uh, somebody this morning said to me, she said, uh, hey, where were you last night? And I said, um, doing research. <laughs> and um, my first thought was, who ratted me out? <laughs> Which turned out to be Jack Brooks, my seven-year-old. <laughs> and my second thought was to stick to my story. So I said, yes, I was, uh, I was doing research, non-government funded research, as a matter of fact. And my preliminary conclusion is, is that the uh, trout population in the Yampa River is quite good. So I'm, I'm happy to be here today. Uh, Elon and I are in from Washington, so we're from Washington. We're here to help. Uh, <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, just kidding. But actually, we are here from Washington. To we are here to help you try to understand the, the age we live in and the challenges we face in terms, of, uh, in terms of foreign policy. And since it's just two of us instead of four people to cover one topic, uh, we're going to just kind of have a colloquy here and ask each other questions and respond to each other uh, about issues that we're kind of seized with in, in Washington on the foreign policy front. And then we'll, uh, I think we have an hour. Is that right? An hour, Jennifer? An hour. And um, we will uh, we'll open it up to questions and answers and get into things that you may want to uh, talk about that we don't uh, get a chance to, uh, to address. Elon, his biography is in your uh, program, so I won't spend too much uh, time on it so we can get into talking about things. Uh, but he's a senior vice president at the American Foreign Policy Council, which is in Washington, just a few blocks from the uh, Heritage Foundation. Um, he's a very prolific writer and commentator on, on foreign policy issues. Uh, in my view, uh, he's uh, the go-to guy on Iran. So I hope we'll get a chance. To, I sure, imagine yeah. we're going to get a chance yeah, to talk about yeah. that today. I, I don't have a day. A day doesn't go by that I don't get something on Iran uh, from Elon in my inbox. Yeah. So he's really capable there. He also can talk about Russia, uh, the Middle East, and a number, number of other, other topics. Um, so I think that's so. Uh, and uh, he's got some books. I think you have a book here, too, as well. I so do. buy one of his uh, books. Uh, to have a, a chance for him to sign it. And... Um, I think we're ready to uh, get ready to get started. That's, right? that's a very generous introduction. Uh, we are from Washington. We are here to try to help. Um, but I, I, th I think you want me to start? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Okay. So, so uh, just by way of uh, introduction, uh, my name is Elon Berman. I'm the senior vice president at the American Foreign Policy Council. I work at this uniquely Washingtonian of institutions, which is called a think tank, which allows us to, uh, every think tank has their own different focus. Mine works a lot with Congress, uh, and I personally work a lot with the US military, trying to help them make sense of three separate things, uh, Russia, uh, Iran, and radical Islam. 
which used to be three separate things. Now it's all one big thing. Um, so it, but it doesn't make my job any easier, but it does make it really hard to understand what's happening in the Middle East and uh, sort of particularly in Syria and places like Iraq. So hopefully uh, I'll be able to sort of unpack that a little bit for you guys in the time that we have. And if I haven't, in the Q&A, stand up and holler and let me know sort of uh, what you want to know about. Uh, I, am, I get paid to be a generalist, to be a, a mile wide and an inch deep. So uh, I think I am perfectly suited to try to avoid your questions as much as I can. So, <laughs> so let's, let's um, there's a lot, I really want to get into the, I call them the big five, uh, where I spend a lot of my time, and that's Russia, China. Iran, North Korea, terrorism, and I think we'll get a little bit into Afghanistan today, or maybe something else as we wander, wander through this, uh, this situation. But, uh, you know, Iran is an issue that you have tremendous expertise on, um, and the, the president is thinking about certification of the Iran nuclear deal. It's been certified twice now in right. his administration, but there's another one coming up in September? October. October, October. okay. Uh, is it quarterly, is that what it is, or something yeah, along that line, basically yeah. quarterly. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, how is this deal going? What, you know, maybe what we should do? Um, so th th this is, I, I think, the $64,000 question because everything and really almost everything that we think about the Middle East revolves around how we approach this issue, how we approach Iran, how we think about the Iranian nuclear deal. So. Let me start by sort of explaining. I, I as Peter knows, I, I'm not a big fan of the deal. Uh, and I'm not a big fan of the deal for a whole host of reasons, but the most significant of which is that the deal has provided an enormous boon to the Iranian regime. Right? This is the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism, uh, supporting proxies like Hamas and Hezbollah, uh, and uh, Shiite militias in Iraq. And the deal has conferred to Iran an enormous economic windfall. In fact. A windfall that's so it's really a $1.5 billion question as opposed to no, a $64,000 right, right, right. so, $64, so, so question. So, so this is actually, the numbers are actually really useful because um, the numbers are so large that most people don't understand what we're actually talking about. Um, you've heard, if you guys have read in the press, you've heard that Iran uh, stood, received uh, something somewhere between $100 billion and $150 billion in direct sanctions relief as a result of the nuclear deal. And that sounds like a lot of money. I, I work for a nonprofit. I have no idea how much money that is. Um, but I can tell you how much money that is for the Iranians. Iranian national GDP in 2014 was $415 billion. So what you're actually looking at is an economic infusion into the Iranian economy equivalent to one quarter of their annual GDP, right? One quarter. And so the, the comparable stats for you guys to think about is the U.S. gross sort of national GDP last year, 2016, was something, uh, I wrote it down, I checked it this morning, it was $18.57 trillion. If we gave the same proportional amount of money, or if we received the same proportional amount of money, it would be as if somebody gave us $4.6 trillion in near-term cash. So what would you guys do with all that money? I know what I would do. I would do everything everything. And so here's the problem, because you have a deal that the Obama White House talked a great deal about being tactical, right? This doesn't deal with democracy promotion, this doesn't deal with human rights, this doesn't deal with ballistic missiles or terrorism, this deals with Iran's nuclear program. But the benefits that have been conferred to Iran as a result are strategic. It allows them to do everything else. All of these other issues that we're concerned about are getting much, much worse as a result of the money and the framework that the Obama administration constructed. So this is what the Trump administration has walked into. This is the sort of the dilemma that they're facing. And trying to figure out what to do about it is really, uh, they're, they're having a difficult time. Because there's really only two things that they can do. You can, well, there's really three, but you, you can certify the deal, as they've been doing so far, and try to keep the agreement uh, under the assumption that it's not a bilateral agreement, it's the US and five other countries that signed this agreement. So if the U.S. walks away, the agreement might actually remain in force, uh, even if the U.S. isn't at the table, and then we sort of lose any leverage that we have. Um, so if you, you can keep the agreement and hope that you can do things like uh, increase our ability to inspect Iran's nuclear facilities, increase the economic penalties that result if the Iranians don't allow us to inspect, uh, or you can abrogate it, right? You can get rid of the agreement entirely, but that throws you into uncharted waters. You don't really know what, what's gonna come next. 
Or there is this third way, which is I think where we're heading towards this fall, which is the president's going to not certify that Iran is complying with the agreement, but he's gonna stop short of saying that Iran is in material breach of it. Uh, he's gonna say the Iranians are doing all sorts of tactical bad things, and that's gonna activate language for new sanctions and things like that, right? It's sort of having your cake and eating it too. Uh, he gets to say that the deal is a bad deal and the framework isn't really working, but he doesn't really want to completely wipe the slate clean. And I, I think that's the direction that the White House is heading. Is the, has anybody found any evidence of cheating at all on this, on this agreement? So, so I think this is an excellent question. Uh, so the answer is yes or no. Um, no, it, right, that's a very lawyerly, I'm sorry, I apologize. I, I, I was listening to the lawyers before and sorry. Right. Um, on one hand. Right, on the right, other yeah. hand, right. So, so Economists. The, the answer is yes and no, because there are things, uh, sort of tactical things that are stipulated in the deal that the Iranians are not complying with. Like, for example, the size of the stockpile of low enriched uranium that they have uh, is bigger than it's supposed to be. The number of centrifuges that they're spinning are slightly bigger than they're supposed to be. But, so, but, here, but the devil's in the details, right? So in order for the deal to go away, in order for the White House to say the Iranians aren't in compliance, the Iranians have to be in material breach. And no one has yet defined what a material breach is, right? So what you have <laughs> is a situation where the US intelligence community comes to the White House and says, the Iranians are in tactical breach of sort of all these different things. And then the White House has to go argue with the other countries in the P5 plus one and say, well, is this a significant enough violation? Or is this, right? So the, the onus code is on the White House to try to prove that the Iranians are in significant breach, right? That's a really bad way to conduct nuclear diplomacy. And one of the things that I think we're, we're gonna see, or I hope we're gonna see in the fall, is a new discussion on the part of the White House about needing to confer with the other P5 plus one powers about let's actually define what it means to be in compliance with the agreement, let's actually define what it means to be not in compliance with the agreement. So what about their, their missile uh, program? Uh, their ballistic missile program, I and mean, this is a huge concern sure. uh, because often you see countries mate a nuclear program uh, with a ballistic missile program, right. especially a long-range ballistic missile program. Now, the Iranians are able to put satellites in this, into orbit, right. right, which is basically the same thing as an ICBM yeah, right. program. Exactly. And we've sanctioned them, and the, the, the Trump administration has sanctioned them over their violations, and the UN sanctions over their violations. Uh, where are they going with this? Well, so I could sit here all day and regale you with the ways in which the Iran nuclear deal is very deficient. Um, but one of the most profound is the fact that the Obama administration voluntarily took the question of ballistic missiles off the table by itself. Um, this is a fatal error, and it's a fatal error because for any country that wants to develop a weapon of mass destruction, they also have to develop a delivery system, right? They have to get the nuke from there to here hopefully not here, but right from there to their target. And the idea that the Obama White House, as a result of Iranian pressure, took the question of those delivery systems entirely off the table means that the deal is deeply deficient. We don't really have eyes on what they're doing. As a result of the agreement, all those restrictions that existed before uh, under the UN, under multi, sort of the multilateral sanctions regime, right, that prohibited Iran from building long-range ballistic missiles went away. They all got folded into this deal, and they didn't be, they're no longer compulsory, they're advisory, right? So the UN now hopes that Iran won't build a ballistic missile program that can reach the continental United States. It's no longer mandating that Iran can't, right? So if it looks like the Iranians are sort of hauling out of the barn, working on ballistic missiles, it's because they now have the imprimatur of the United Nations that they can actually do that. So what about, we can, we can segue over to North Korea, but I have a question about North Korea. There's always been a concern about North Korea and Iran working together on ballistic missiles right. and, and nuclear matters. I mean, what's your, what's your opinion on this? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and uh, for, for a very simple reason. Uh, President Obama, uh, to explain it in, in Washingtonian terms, misspoke when he said that the Iran nuclear deal closed off all pathways for Iran to get a nuclear bomb. Why? Because there's really only two ways to do it. You can build one or you can buy one. And the nuclear deal deals with that first pathway, right? The building, right? Looking at their internal, uh, their domestic nuclear facilities and, and sort of production. But that second pathway, the idea that Iran can acquire weapons of mass destruction technology from abroad is almost, it's the language of the text is almost completely silent. Uh, Iran now has this massive infusion of cash, 
And Iran has a long-standing strategic partnership with the North Koreans on ballistic missiles and on nuclear technology, right? Every single North Korean nuclear test that's taken place in the last decade, right? There's four of them, I think, right? Five. Uh, five, five, the, the five, um, has had in attendance a delegation of Iranian nuclear engineers. Now, I, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, right? I mean, it, it suggests to me that the Iranians are more than casually involved in the North Korean nuclear program. So what you have now is you have motive and you have opportunity and you also have resources to have this strategic partnership kick into high gear in a way that's frankly very dangerous. You know, and it was surprising to me, I mean, I thought for a while when I would write about Iran and their ballistic missile program that they, they were actually outlegging the North Koreans. Right. Didn't it seem like right. that? I mean, they, they put a satellite in the space before that. Prior to that, the Russians were helping the Iranians. I don't know if everybody understands this, and I'll, I'll do a quick uh, aside here about uh, a space program and an ICBM program. Back in 1957, before all of us were born, there was a thing called Sputnik. You probably read about it on your e-books. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> what happened was is that the Soviet Union put a small s s satellite transmitter into, into space. And um, we were really unhappy about this. It was a public relations disaster. They beat us in the space race. They put up a probably a 100-pound satellite up into space. And, you know, people, we hear about this, but in the bowels of the Pentagon, Dr. Strangeloves were really concerned because they knew that once you're able to put a satellite into orbit, it's the same technology that's required for putting a warhead from an ICBM into orbit. And the Russians did beat us in the ICBM program with their R6 and R7 rockets. They actually had an ICBM program before us. So that was why it was a, a tremendous national security concern. So when countries go out there, they are often covering up intercontinental ballistic missile programs, military programs, with space programs. So the idea that Iran can put a satellite into space means they're on their way to uh, developing an intercontinental ballistic missile program if they so choose. Now, for a long time, it seemed like Iran was ahead of, of North Korea. But now, of course, we've seen what we've seen with North Korea a tremendous number of ballistic missile launches, uh, more ballistic missile launches than we've ever seen before. And they're committed, clearly, to their ballistic missile and, uh, and nuclear, nuclear programs. And they are, when they talk about being able to threaten Guam and the United States, uh, they're serious, and they're making progress in that direction. Now, I'm not going to tell you that they're there yet. Um, of course, you know, if you take a if you take a shot, a pot shot with an ICBM with a nuclear weapon on top, and you try to hit something as large as the continental United States, that's not really that difficult. But if you try to hit a city, uh, that is much more difficult. Or if you try to hit an island like Guam, which is only 210 square miles, that's even more difficult. But they are these threats that they're making are very serious, uh, and they are developing the capability. Now, where they've demonstrated. Um, long-range missiles. One of the things that most people don't realize, unless you're following this very closely, is when the North Koreans launched these, what they're calling ICBM tests, they basically shot a missile up high into the air, but not a great distance. Some of these launches only went, went less than 1,000 miles, but they went 3,000 miles into the air. One was 2,000, one was 3,000. And that's why they said, first of all, it can hit Alaska or the west coast of the United States because the rocket scientists, when they flatten that out, like when you throw a ball or you know, a typical ballistic missile trajectory, that's how far they believe that would go. And the second one went up 3,000 miles in the air, and you stretch that out, it goes at least to the mid part of the United States, perhaps even, even further. But they haven't tested it at that length. The one thing where they're probably short is is on their nuclear warhead. We know we've had five tests. We haven't had one uh, recently, uh, but they've had five tests. They claim that they've been able to miniaturize uh, a weapon or weaponize a nuclear warhead. And what this means is that when you we do an underground testing, you send this rig down into the ground. It's a scientific and technical grid with all sorts of sensors on it and obviously fissile material to create an explosion. It's a much more challenging thing is to take that testing rig uh, which probably looks like the uh, control deck over there uh, for, the, for the sound, and then make it into something that you can put inside of a nose cone on top of a missile and withstand intercontinental ballistic missile flight. 
uh, which includes tremendous pressures and temperatures and g-forces and vibration. Do you remember, this is before all of you were born too, but when the, the capsules would come back from the space launches and you'd see all the flames coming off of it and stuff like that, that's basically what these, uh, a warhead has to deal with. Uh, when an a, a ICBM warhead in its final phase is going somewhere around 15,000 miles per hour, maybe more. Um, so this is, they have to be able to shrink it, miniaturize it, weaponize it, make sure that it goes boom when it reaches its intended target, which is no small feat in itself, and then get it there. Um, so that's where the North Koreans are probably short, but they're working on that. Uh, they're working on the warhead, warhead part of it. So what they say, uh, they're very serious and they are, making, they are making significant progress. And of course, what I'm worried about is I don't care if Iran or North Korea is in front, but they can share this technology. Uh, with one another, which increases the threat, obviously, uh, to the United States, because we are clearly, in my view, in the crosshairs of Iran. We're clearly in the crosshairs of, um, of, of North Korea. Um, what about Russia? <laughs> well, so <clears throat> our relationship with Russia isn't going very well. Um, you don't say. No, no, and, and it's interesting. I'm a, I'm a native Russian speaker. I, I read the Russian media a lot, and, and uh, I couldn't echo strongly enough that I think James Taranto is absolutely correct. I think sort of what we're looking at, sort of this hullabaloo over uh, Russian collusion is, frankly, uh, I think there's some circumstantial there there in the sense that uh, I, I also would not be very surprised if there were indictments that came down on some peripheral players um, uh, that sort of oscillated around the Trump campaign. Um, but you have to look not only at what the president and his principles say, but also at what they do. If you look at, and we all know that personnel is policy, right? Uh, the US government uh, personalities uh, tend to take on a life of their own and sort of shape relations towards different countries, including towards Russia. If you look at the team, and it's not a full team yet, but the team that is being assembled to deal with the Russia policy, you're looking at the National Security Advisor, General McMaster, the guy who literally wrote the handbook for land warfare against Russia and Europe, right, which he did in his last post um, on, uh, when, he, when he was working on training and doctrine. Um, you look at uh, General Mattis, who is not, he's not a fan of Iran, but he's not a fan of Russia either. Um, as Secretary of Defense, you look at people like Fiona Hill, uh, who are very hawkish on Iran, who's now serving at the National Security Council. And what it begins to look like an awful lot is, at least to me, like a good cop, bad cop approach where the president is saying things about the need for a more pacific relationship with Russia. But at the same time, he's putting people in place uh, that are very likely to play that bad cop role. And that perception, the perception that the uh, Trump administration wants improved relations but is willing to strike back if there aren't improved relations, is being echoed in the Russian press as well. Uh, you know, at the, in the early days of the Trump administration, there was a lot of euphoria in the Russian press about, oh, Trump is really, you know, he, he says a lot of things about improving relations with Moscow. All of that euphoria is gone now. Uh, the Russian press very clearly sees him as adversarial, more adversarial than President Obama, and is bracing itself for a very significant slowdown in relations. And a lot of the things that he has done on the periphery of this conversation, the conversation that's taking place in Congress, that's taking place um, in the media, uh, has reinforced this idea. Uh, for example, uh, Russia since uh, 2014 has waged a war of aggression against Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine, the, the whole conflict came about as a result of Ukraine's decision to uh, sign an association agreement with the European Union, essentially making a, a firm decision to break off economically and diplomatically from the Russian orbit and sort of join the European orbit, uh, which precipitated uh, a, um, a heavy-handed Russian political response, a, a sort of, uh, um, and a counter-response from uh, the, what is known as the Maidan Revolution, right, a, a grassroots uh, democracy movement that ousted the former pro-Russian president, uh, Viktor Yanukovych. Um, this, in turn, forced Moscow's the man. Yeah, Moscow's man, right, Moscow. exactly, exactly. Moscow was not happy with uh, Ukraine's decision, which was made over the objections of the pro-Kremlin president, 
uh, and the Ukrainian people weren't happy with the pro-Kremlin president's decision to annul that agreement, right? They came out on the streets, millions. There's a great Netflix documentary, by the way, if you haven't seen it, it's called Winter on Fire. It's all about the 2014 Maidan protests and sort of you know, how people died and sort of the, the, uh, the sort of individual heroes that were born as a result, people like Andrew Parubi, who's the new uh, speaker of the Ukrainian parliament. Um, but anyway, um, ever since then, right, uh, in the spring of 2014, the Russians uh, made an incursion into the east of Ukraine, into the region that's known as the Donbas. And it, they've remained there ever since by proxy because they have managed to provide arms and weaponry and political support to separatist elements that are fighting against the Ukrainian state. Uh, this is something that the Obama administration yelled a lot about. It's also something they did absolutely nothing about. But under the Trump administration, you've seen the beginnings of movement towards a more robust Ukraine policy. The Trump administration has authorized uh, the provision of defensive weapons from the United States to help augment the very substantial gains that the Ukrainian military is has made. Is Mattis there now? He's there now. The Secretary of Defense is in he, Ukraine. He's there right now. now. And, and also, uh, despite all of the, uh, I would say, overheated rhetoric about uh, sort of America's place in NATO and sort of you know, whether our NATO allies are contributing enough or not, what you've actually seen on the ground in these places, in uh, Ukraine and in Eastern Europe, is a stepped up op tempo, a stepped up operational tempo where NATO forces, right, from the NATO countries are beginning to rotate more frequently through Eastern Europe as a deterrent against Russia, right? So I think it's necessary, and this is a very long way of saying that I think it's necessary to separate what people say from what people do. You can, there's a lot of rhetoric about uh, collusion, there's a lot of rhetoric about how Trump is soft on Russia. I think the empirical evidence doesn't bear that out at all. You know, a couple of years ago I had some, this is, yeah, probably four or five years ago, I had some European security officials come to Heritage and uh, come in to see me. I won't tell you who they were, and had a very good conversation about issues, including Russia, and they said to me, what do you folks do about Russian propaganda? And I was like, what Russian propaganda? I mean, Americans don't, don't, don't read it, don't buy into it. The Cold War, you know, not since probably, uh, I don't think anybody's even talking about it. Of course, that was several years ago. So now it's different. Right. And if you really want to do some amazing reading is, is to see what the Russians are doing in terms of propaganda today. Uh, I mean, do you have any? Yeah, I, yeah I'd yeah. love no, to no. hear some of your thoughts on armies, troll, armies of trolls and bots and fake news and all of this sort of stuff. I mean, it's, it's back and forth. So this is, a, I, I think, a really interesting conversation. It's not just about Russia. It's about countries like China, countries like Iran, authoritarian regimes that have a, a distinct approach towards media, how they shape it, how they control it. Um, China has what you guys all know, right? The Great Firewall uh, of China. You've heard this term, right? Mm -hmm. I've experienced it. I've uh, hung out in hotel rooms in Beijing and typed in uh, Tiananmen Square and democracy and gotten the page 404 forbidden, right? The sort of the, the Google request was halted. Well, not Google, because <coughs> Google's whatever. But, but the Bing request was halted um, in response. Um, the Russians have a different approach. Russia's approach is to essentially create a wall of sound, right? For all those of you, by the way, who are um, rock and roll aficionados, like myself, uh, there is a very distinct rock term called a wall of sound, right? This is when, when sort of guitarists like Eddie Van Halen stand uh, in front of this massive wall of martial speakers and, and you know, your hearing is affected for days, right? This is what Rush is doing on the informational space. Rush's goal isn't to just provide fake news. It's to provide enough fake news that America doesn't make strategic decisions, right? So you sort of saw this in Ukraine, right? So Russian, very clearly pro-Russian separatists in the east of Ukraine downed Malaysian Airlines uh, Flight 17 uh, in July of, was it July of 2015? Mm -hmm. um, and the response from the Russians was to put out documentary after documentary, phone news report after phone news report that said that, well, actually it's not clear who downed it, uh, maybe the Ukrainian government was responsible. The goal of this was not to absolve Russia of culpability. The goal of this was to muddy the waters enough to prevent decisive action from Russia's adversaries. And you sort of see this a lot with the way Russia has penetrated um, sort of the American media space. And by the way, uh, there's a separate conversation to be had about how our 
government has very willingly allowed them to do so. Uh, if, you, if you are interested in, in reading things that will make your hair stand on end, you can go to the Daily Beast and read about how uh, the only English language television station that inmates at Guantanamo Bay have access to are, is Russia Today, right? Is the oh. Russian sponsored, state sponsored mm -hmm. propaganda. Um, I, I, my sense is uh, that once that report came out, things began to move a little bit, but that was, <laughs> that was the case for a while. Um, but Russia's, the, I think the proper way to think about Russian information warfare was not necessarily that Russia was interested in elevating one candidate over another. It was that Russia wanted to inject doubt into the integrity of American democratic processes writ large. Mm -hmm. Why? Because if Americans begin to doubt our own institutions, we're less credible at promoting them abroad, right? And then Russia wins. And so that, my sense is, that's the sort of the broader strategic purpose of what Russia's trying to do informationally, but it's enormously corrosive because it is such a big and such a well-funded effort. And they're also using bots, which are linked computers uh, to put out this, that put out the, these emails. I mean, I'm, I'm amazed I follow some of these uh, pro-Russia sort of institutions, uh, or I say media institutions, and I see stuff that they put out that is blatantly not true. But I know that because I have some expertise in this area, but not everybody else will. And they'll see something and they'll believe it. And that's exactly what they're, what they're hoping to do, to undermine, they know they can't be as strong as the West, but they want to be as strong as the West. So they're doing everything, whether it's short of military operations, if possible, to, um, to, weaken, to weaken the West to raise Russia's standing uh, globally. I mean, that's, that's, my, that's my view on it. No, I, I think that's exactly right. And, and again, right, so it, it's different from what other countries are doing. Um, and, uh, but in terms of its broad reach, uh, so just to give you guys a sort of empirical data point uh, that helps contextualize this, um, Russia the United States today, uh, our international broadcasting, US, what's sort of known uh, by, in the slate of hand as USIB, US International Broadcasting, is something like $1.4 billion um, that is allocated by the federal government uh, to American official broadcasting towards every region in the world, right? So everything from uh, the VOA Russian service to the Persian News Network to Radio Marti, which broadcasts to Cuba. Um, the Russian uh, media effort, so the analogous media effort, is several times larger than this. And it's oriented not only at us, at the West, uh, it's also oriented at what Russia calls compatriots, right, which are ethnic Russians which happen to live in places that used to be the Soviet Union but are no longer the Soviet Union, right, which Russia wants to reintegrate. And also, because all politics is local, at the Russian population itself, right? The messages are different. For us, they're trying to confuse us. For the compatriots, they're trying to call them back. For the Russians themselves, they're trying to say, yeah, things are kind of bad, but they could be much worse, right? But the overall construct is an ambitious one. It's a big one. And it's one that's far better funded than the way we're yelling in response. I th I, let me say a few words. We don't have too much time left, uh, unfortunately, because we do want to get to questions and answers. But let me say a few words about, about terrorism. Uh, and just before I came down here, I was talking about Afghanistan on a, a, with a radio station in Seattle. And I was um, talking about uh, statistics. I gave them some empirical statistics. And I was saying, I think we're doing pretty well in the war on terror. Uh, it's not in the news today, but the, the progress we've made in Iraq against the Islamic State uh, Mosul has been returned to basically Iraqi control. There are still some issues in Tal Afar uh, where they retreated to. Raqqa has been basically taken 70% back. That's the capital of the caliphate in Syria. Um, and in the United States, I was saying that in 2015, there were 15 terrorist plots or attacks. Most of them ISIS related, almost all of them ISIS related. In 2016, there were 12. And in 2017, so far, there are three. Um, now, that doesn't mean that we're out of the woods and that the war on terror is over. We still have the issue of Afghanistan. Um, but I think, we're making, I think we're making progress. And I, I think, at this point, that the decrease in terror attacks in the United States is directly related to the dissembling or the taking apart of, of the Islamic State, which we're making progress on. Now, I'm not here to tell you that the global violent Islamist extremist movement is over. 
I think there's still going to be tremendous challenges abroad with this. For instance, the most effective fighting force today in Syria, outside the Russians and the Syrians and the Iranians, is, is actually an al-Qaeda group called al-Nusra, which has another name, but most people knew it as al-Nusra originally. Uh, I think the Islamic State is looking for other places to go. Uh, they are, and they will try to find any place where they can plan, train, and operate where the situation is chaotic and lawless and, and ungoverned. So I don't think it's over. But as many of us have been calling for, we need a greater pressure on the Islamic State because I felt that once we started to take them apart, I think that the number of inspirations, the, the, the inspirations for people to take up a violence against innocence uh, here would, would decrease. They wouldn't look like a, a winner they would start to be looked at as what they were. And I think we're making progress in that, in that uh, vein. In terms of Afghanistan, I think the president did the right thing. Uh, I'm very comfortable with his plan and, and basically for four reasons. Uh, that's his counterterrorism focus. Um, the fact that he decided that we're not there to nation build, which I think is critically, which I think is critically important. I don't think it's important that we turn, uh, try to turn Afghanistan into a Western-style democracy with, with free markets. I think he's got he's on the mark he's on the mark uh, there. Um, his um, desire to have a regional strategy, I think, was important. I wrote a column a, a month or so ago saying you you can't get Afghanistan policy right without getting Pakistan right policy right. Uh, Pakistan is a huge problem for us in, in that part of the world. Uh, they give they allow uh, or some of the people that were fighting there. Um, such as the Taliban and the Haqqani network are able to find refuge over the border from Afghanistan uh, in, in Pakistan. And um, so I think that we're on the right track there. And, and the, uh, some folks have asked, well, why do you think this is uh, successful? Or, you know, we've been there for almost 16 years. I said, well, to my knowledge, there's only been one or two, I should say, two terror attacks that actually had some sort of ties to Afghanistan. One, of course, was 9-11. Um, and of course, we know the terrible tragedy of 9-11. Of and we can't forget that. And then there, I think there was only one other plot, and that was the one in New York, in Times Square, uh, where somebody who had some ties to the Taliban tried to blow up an SUV, and he came one spark away from doing it, actually. Most people don't realize that. It would have been a terrible, a terrible attack. But other than that, um, we've not seen it come out of there. So I would say in many ways that we have been successful there because we prevented Afghanistan from becoming once again a place where terrorists can, international terrorists can plan, train, and operate, especially against the United, the United States. So I think the president is on, the, there, there are challenges there, uh, significant, significant challenges for us. And I wish the president had talked a little bit, and I wrote about this in my Boston Herald column, I wish he'd talked about Iran and Russia a little bit. Uh, he probably was thinking about it, but he, you know, you can only have so much time in a speech to talk about things. Russia is supporting the Taliban. Um, I, being outside of government, I don't know to what extent, but some of the things that I hear is it could include weapons. Um, and we're fighting the Taliban. Uh, the other thing is Iran has been there for many, many years. This is, these are countries that both border Afghanistan and have a very important uh, interest in what, in what happens there. The president was also to write, to talk about India and getting them to do more, to try to help develop Afghanistan so that they can uh, fight their own, the insurgency uh, to the greatest extent, extent possible. India has a tremendous interest in what happens in, in neighboring Afghanistan once again, in that this could become like Pakistan, a place where terror attacks are launched against, against India. So uh, critically important there. But I think, we are, I, think we are making, I think we are making progress, but uh, complacency is not where we, where we should be. And we have to be careful about vacuums like we saw in Iraq with our full withdrawal that led to the uh, development of, of the Islamic State and the terrible things that, uh, that, that came, came from that. Do you have any thoughts on that? No, no, I, I'm the only thing, I, I agree completely. And the only thing I would add is that we are, uh, our counterterrorism policy uh, has been for, I, I think, far too long, a little bit like whack-a-mole where you know, a terrorist group rises up and we sort of focus all of our, the lion's share of our attention. So the Islamic State, uh, since their rise to prominence in mid-2014 in Iraq, uh, has occupied the lion's share of our attention. And this has allowed uh, a couple of things to happen that I think are very significant. One is that we almost completely have ignored Al-Qaeda. 
as a threat actor. Um, and Al Qaeda is still around. In fact, if you look at places like North Africa, if you look at places like the yeah. south of Yemen, uh, Al Qaeda occupies more territory today than at any time in its history. And right, and moreover, Al Qaeda, you know, is flourishing in the darkness. Right, they're an organization; they want to be around for a while. So they've used this breathing room, this uh, temporary respite, to build a long-term strategy. Uh, so that's one thing. The second thing is that. I want you all to think about the Islamic State like a tube of toothpaste, right? So if you take a tube of toothpaste and you peel off the foil cap and you squeeze it really hard, if you squeeze it hard enough, the toothpaste comes out the top and it comes out the bottom. And this is precisely what's happening in the caliphate itself. As the US and coalition forces are beginning to whittle down the territory that the Islamic State occupies and controls, the Islamic State is going elsewhere. There has been, over the last three months, the rise of an Islamic State proto-caliphate in the Philippines. The Islamic State for a year has been calling for foreign fighters not to go to Syria, but to go to Libya, right? So we are reaching a moment of inflection where the Islamic State may comparatively decline in the places where we're looking, but it may begin to rise in places where we're not. And that's something that the administration is going to have to really focus very heavily on. And what, the other thing about the, the president, I, I know I had four points and I, forgot, I only gave you three. <laughs> Who's that happened to a presidential candidate once, right? Yeah. Uh, is no timetable for Afghanistan. It's got to be condition-based and telling the enemy when you're going to leave. There's a famous uh, or infamous anecdote about a Taliban prisoner who told an American, he said, you Americans have the watches, but we have the time. They're not going anywhere. So uh, we'll, we're going we're gonna to stop here, but I wanted to tell you one, uh, I was speaking to somebody today here at the, at the conference, and I said, geez, we got a 3 o'clock, you know, we're going to do ours at 3 o'clock, that's a terrible time in the afternoon to do this, uh, everybody will be falling asleep, and she said, I never sleep when you, when you talk. I said, I said, but you won't sleep tonight either after I talk. <laughs> Right. So we didn't get it. We wanted to talk about China, but you know, it's going through all this stuff. So if you have questions on China, we're happy to talk. Or anything else, uh, we're happy to do that. And we'll, I'll open it up to a question and question and answer now. We'll start over here. Hi, um, Amelia Hupfield. Thank you both so much for your time. Um, just a quick question. I've been reading a lot in the news about the U.S. missile defense system, and mm -hmm. it sounds like. Uh, reports so far of success are fairly mixed. Can you guys speak to that and maybe speak to how we should address that going forward? I, I think, uh, and I wrote a column uh, just recently about protecting Guam. So you may want to may want to check that out, and we uh, we can do it. Missile defense is critically important. Um, we have the the sovereign right to defend ourselves against anybody who shoots a missile at us, whether it's North Korea, Iran, China, or Russia. We should be developing this, and it was a long time. It was a very political debate. And the, the, uh, the Clinton administration begrudgingly did a little bit of it. The Bush administration went full ahead. The Obama administration went full reverse, canceling our program in Europe that the Bush administration had worked very hard to do. Uh, and um, now we're back again where we have this tremendous threat from North Korea. Um, it's basically missile defense is equivalent to hitting a bullet with a bullet in space. It's incredibly technologically difficult. Um, and we've made tremendous progress. We can do that. In fact, a number of years ago, we'd gotten to the point where we could hit a spot on a bullet with a bullet in space. But the other thing you know, anybody who served in the military, is that um, no weapon system is 100% effective. So you have to have a lot of missile defense. And you've got to continue to test. And you have to continue to develop it. And it would be much better to have the ability to shoot down a missile than to absorb a shot and then have to respond. So it's critical that we move, that we move forward with that. And in terms of Guam, I think we're in pretty good shape in terms of Guam. Uh, we have uh, systems aboard ships uh, that can take out an intermediate range ballistic missile uh, in mid-course phase. You have your boost phase, which would be the best time to get it, but it's actually the hardest time to get it because you have to be close enough to be able to do it. Mid-course, the Aegis-class destroyers can take shots at that. And then you have things like THAAD, which is the, I always get this wrong, terminal high altitude, air defense. Air defense. I always play theater, but it's, right. but it's right. the terminal. THAAD, T-H-A-A-D, you've seen it. Um, it. It can get things in its terminal phase. There's also Patriot, 
missiles and things along that line. Uh, but we need to be able to defend ourselves. Um, it just makes no sense um, that we should leave ourselves vulnerable to the likes of regimes that, uh, especially the ones, some of the ones like, I wouldn't want to leave myself vulnerable to Iran or North Korea. Uh, so we need, we need that capability. Right, but I also think there's a larger conversation here, and right, we don't have the time to sort of rehash the history of missile defense, but suffice it to say that from the Bush one administration forward, we have made strategic choices prioritizing defense against the limited threats, defense against uh, small adversaries, smaller adversaries like North Korea, like Iran. And we have been hampered in the way we built our missile defense system by political pressure that's been exerted by China, it's been exerted by Russia, right? Which for very logical reasons to them, want to limit right. our defenses so we don't invalidate their strategic arsenal. We are now, I think again, at this sort of inflection point where yes, absolutely, we are much better defended than we were a decade ago, but that defense is still oriented against those limited rogue yep. state threats. And there's a larger policy dog that is embarking, which is why is it not permissible for the United States to defend itself against all adversaries? Uh, that's a debate that I would really like this administration to take up uh, because yes, it will cause some turbulence in our relations with Russia, it'll cause some turbulence in our relations with Russia, but you know, as they say, the first order of government is the protection of the American people, everything else is just window dressing. Uh, thank you both very much for being here. Uh, this is a serious subject, but one we need to, to hear about and discuss. Russia seems to be the common denominator uh, way too often, and you just mentioned it again, Elon. Uh, you mentioned the amount of money they're spending. I think back to the Reagan era, and he re reasoned, rightfully so, that they couldn't afford to keep up the uh, funding their military industrial complex. We had the, the arms race. We won. They lost. Uh, my perception is that, and my understanding, is that the Russian economy is not all that robust right now. So how long and, and can they afford to keep funding at the level they are? Is that part of the, the calculus we ought to be undertaking is to, to quash them economically? Oil prices are really hurting them. Right? Yeah. 40% right. of the Russian gross domestic product comes from oil and natural gas. And but when it's this low, it's, it's, really, uh, it's really a challenge. Over, over time, no, I think that's right. But, but I'm going to throw out the, sort of a strange statistic just to, sort of to get to my, to my larger point. This is an unrepresentative government in Russia, and they're spending money on the things that they want to spend money on, the things that reaffirm their self-image as a global power. So, for example, did you know that the average life expectancy of a Russian right now is lower than that, it's about on a par with North Korea, lower than that of Saudi Arabia and Tanzania, right? Russia is a country that aspires to first world status, but is showing third world demographic trends. And you know why that is? It's because they didn't have a peace dividend after the end of the Cold War. They didn't allocate resources from the military to education, to uh, civil society, to healthcare, to the things that cumulatively make up the lifeblood of a healthy nation, right? So Russia is rotten from the inside in terms of uh, the way it is structured. And this is why when we talk about Russia, it's necessary to separate out Putin's Russia and the rest of Russia. Because Putin's Russia is spending a lot of uh, money and a lot of time focusing on things that aggrandize itself. That is, I think, uh, an interesting question. Uh, and it's certainly one that, I would put it this way, if anybody can give you an accurate statistic as to sort of how long you know, their Federal Reserves will hold out, I, they're probably being a little bit overly confident. But I would tell you this, that the more oil prices remain low, and the more there is a fairly robust international coalition that applies continued sanctions on Russia for the things they're doing in places like Ukraine, the more we tighten those economic screws, the more we force them to make hard choices. Whether the choices that they make, because they're an un unrepresentative government, are the ones that we like is a different story, but I would like to actually ask the question. Здравствуйте. <laughs> Um, there we go. There we're we're going to have drinks later. We'll, well, uh, I was we'll... trying to prepare for the future, so I thought yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd learn Russian. 
Uh, so <laughs> you, you mentioned briefly that, that uh, states that are antagonistic to uh, American ideals are spending a lot of money in self-promotion. Um, recently, Oliver Stone did a fabulous reportage, of, uh, the interviews with Vladimir Putin. Uh, what a nice guy. I mean, just what a lovely gentleman. Uh, and, and so downtrodden, and he had such a hard life. I'm just, where can, how can we encourage, because w what we've done when, when the president comes out and doesn't support the opposition, doesn't support the freedom fighters, uh, uh, opens, opens free trade with um, Cuba, I'm misstating it, but basically opens diplomatic relations with Cuba and undermines the freedom fighters in Cuba and around the world, they get disheartened. He's actually, it's, it's not just supporting the, the communist state, it's actually undermining right. people who are fighting on behalf of freedom. So how can we, where do we go from here? I mean, Oliver Stone can do that. There must be people out there who can do it for the side of, of good and right. So, so two things. So I, I think that's absolutely right. And I actually think- Who's Oliver Stone? <laughs> But he's famous. He's famous, and he's now speaking yeah. for America. I think he's I speaking mean, for Roger. He's speaking for Oliver Stone. But but my Not point is, they <laughs> think he's <laughs> they <laughs> think he's speaking for America. No, so so this is I, I think an interesting thing on two fronts. First of all, I also watched those interviews. I also was surprised by how nice and and uh, warm and cuddly Vladimir Putin was. I totally didn't get that at all from his background as a KGB agent behind the Iron Curtain. But. Um, <laughs> But I wouldn't do that. There's an inherent danger to this type of promotion in which you elevate personalities over governments, right? Russia is not a government so much as it is a criminal, vertically integrated criminal enterprise, right? Where money is leaving the country in droves. We have normalized the Russian government by personalizing Putin to the point where a few years from now, it's, I mean, he's up for re-election next year. It's, uh, the rumor has it that he's, I mean, we clearly know he's going to get re-elected, but the rumor is that after he gets handily re-elected with 99.4% of the vote, he's going to maybe sort of retire or go into semi-retirement. So here's the question. What happens then? Because we've spent so much time talking about Putin the person, we're very liable to look at the next Russian president and say, oh, well, he's comparatively nicer. Let's just do business with him and ignore the whole rotten edifice that rests underneath the Russian presidency. And I think that, that's a very dangerous mistake. And it's compounded by the fact that we have invested very little time and money, not only in Russia, but in other places like Iran, in actually looking at what the future of the country is. The political opponents, the human rights activists, the democracy promoters who can actually chart a different course. We haven't put our money where our mouth is at all in that regard. And frankly, we should. Hi, Lee Corrins from Colorado. A couple of months ago, all the media was concentrating on the meeting between Putin and Trump uh, before at the G20. Mm -hmm. But there was a meeting held in Moscow a couple of weeks earlier that got no publicity at all in the States. A fellow by the name of Henry Kissinger stopped in for a meeting with Putin. Now, that was not Aunt Margaret stopping in for a cup of tea because she was in the neighborhood. Do you know what the basis of that meeting was, who initiated it, and what the purpose was at the end? No. No. I, I don't. Okay. Yeah. A well-kept secret. Well-kept secret. Uh -huh. I think we're... We're good? We got time for one more question, Jennifer? Yeah. Or I think it's, it's my watch this through. We got one more. One more. One more. Okay. Okay. Real quick, Ren Martin, live here in Steamboat. Uh, something that's a little closer to our home and uh, hemisphere, would love to hear your thoughts on Venezuela and Cuba and, and as it relates to Russia, Iran, Hezbollah, as the CIA reported a few weeks back. Want to do that? Yeah, sure. Um, terrible tragedy in Venezuela. Uh, what's, what's going on there? Most, uh, it's uh, self-inflicted, which is even more tragic. Uh, it's like it's like North Korea, the famine that that goes uh, that goes on there. That its economic policies uh, bring that about, and the same thing in same thing in, in Venezuela. I mean, Venezuela is a country uh, that has a strong democratic tradition, one of the oldest in oldest in Latin, in Latin America. 
um, and Maduro is driving it into the ground. And uh, we only can think about the, the human tragedy that's uh, going on there. And I would like to see Latin American states do much more to, uh, to change, the course of, change the course of Venezuela. In terms of Cuba, I was against the normalization. I think I said that a year or two ago when I was uh, here in Steamboat. Um, I think the human rights uh, repression continues. I think that the Cuban government uh, will pocket the money that's coming in. Remember, it's about, what, 80 or 90 percent statist. So people think when they stay at a hotel that it's really run by a private concern. It's really run by the, probably the Cuban military. Um, so the money that's, that's going there is going into the pockets of, of Cuba. The one, the one positive sense, like I said, other than the human tragedy of the, the people that have to live with that sort of political repression, and whether it's in Venezuela or in, in Cuba, is that they're, they're the, and the reason I supported the embargo towards uh, Cuba was that it, it, Cuba was not the problem that it could be in Latin America. As a young naval officer, I served in Central America during the bad old days when El Salvador and Nicaragua were real problems, and Cuba was behind a lot of that. And that's because they got the money from the Soviet Union. And when Chavez was in charge of Venezuela, he was bringing in the likes of, of Hezbollah and the IRGC and uh, others into the, in, into the, uh, into the hemisphere uh, to, uh, to influence things. In fact, I had fun one time with, uh, I wrote a column about this in the New York Post, and CNN called me, and um, Brian Todd, who you probably still see on CNN, we, I, he, wanted, he interviewed me, and we actually had a segment where he called, um, there was a, I got to stop for a second. There was a flight. Do you remember this? Yeah, yeah. There was a flight, a weekly flight, that went from Tehran, Tehran Caracas, to, to Damascus, to, and Caracas, right? to Beirut, to Caracas, Venezuela. And um, so the idea was that it, what was behind it is that it was for tourism. You know, you can imagine the Venezuelan family looking at the glossy brochure about their upcoming visit to the Islamic Republic of Iran on vacation. And um, so Brian Todd actually, and it was Conviasa Iran Air. That's right. So he actually called uh, Conviasa <laughs> and tried to get a ticket on the flight. And of course they said, oh, it's only for business uh, purposes. Oh, it's full up sort of thing. But they were bringing a lot of bad actors into the, into the region. Uh, they, the Iranians were training people in Nicaragua. Uh, I think it's, it's less now that Ahmadinejad and Chavez are gone, right? So, Yes and no, okay. in the sense Another that yes no, no, I'm right. That's a lawyer answer. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> so the answer is there is more attention from the U.S. government being paid to sort of the role of Iran and sort of what Iran has done. But this isn't a thing of the past in the sense that the Iranian penetration of Latin America was for a long time billed in Washington as being a sort of an Ahmadinejad project, right? You guys remember Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, he of the open collar and the members only jacket. That was, yeah, yeah. So, um, so he built personal ties with Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. And within the course of 18 months, they both passed from the scene. Ahmadinejad termed out of office, Hugo Chavez died from cancer. Um, and the assumption, the governing assumption for a lot of U.S. government agencies was that this is all a thing of the past now, right? This is sort of, this was an Ahmadinejad project, it's now gone. The current Iranian president, the quote unquote moderate Hassan Rouhani, who's not a moderate by any measure of our political spectrum, mm -hmm. um, has actually spent a lot of time reaffirming that, oh no, 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 this is an official Iranian government priority, we want to reach out. And incidentally, Iran has more ability to reach out now because it has more money as a result of the nuclear deal, and also because we're not paying attention to Latin America, right? And this is the sort of the dirty little secret of the Obama administration. In September of 2015, John Kerry uh, gave a speech before the Organization of American States in Washington in which he said, quote unquote, the era of the Monroe Doctrine is over, which was code for saying we are no longer going to uh, impose our foreign policy preferences on Latin America. This was this sort of two-step backwards from American engagement in Latin America that has created this empty political space that countries like Iran, actors like Hezbollah, countries like China and Russia have begun to fill. And one of our big challenges in the years ahead is to try to articulate a strategy for the region, but also to begin, this is a zero sum game, to try to begin pushing these guys out. Because the closer they are to our borders, the less soundly we're gonna sleep. I wish we had a chance to talk about a little bit more about China, especially in North Korea, South China Sea, but we, we've run out of time, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Elon. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, guys.